Welcome to the 23rd episode of Delica. I'm Stephanie Tankilisan. And I'm Sweden Lee. And this week we're going to talk about the Jakarta gubernatorial race. So we're going to give you guys a brief introduction on who the candidates are, their brief histories and scandals. Because you ain't a politician without a scandal. We're also going to specifically dig deeper into all three candidates' positions on women's issues, what their goals are, what their specific policies are, and what we think about them. Mm-hmm. And in many ways, this is not so much an episode about endorsing a candidate or anything like that, but really discussing the kinds of policies at play. And, and what we can learn from you know digging into this woman's issue about these candidates and how they think in general. And for those listeners who are in Jakarta, the election is one week away. So remember to register and remember to vote. Wednesday, 15th of February. Also, if you hear a lot of dog sounds, for those who are long-time listeners of Dialogica, I'm sure you've heard of Simone, our podcasting dog. Um, she's around and she might make a lot of noise, so... That's not Simone. Simone's very quiet. Okay, some of it is Simone. The other part is Stacy, which we've also covered in our bonus episode. There you go. There you go. But yes. So, here's to it. So we're going to give you a brief rundown on each gubernatorial candidate's history and context and background. Starting with number one. Starting with number one, uh, Agus Yudoyono and Silviana Murni. Agus Yudoyono is the son of former president Yudoyono, SBA. Um, He was formerly in the Indonesian army. He served time, I think almost 10 years in the army, serving as a part of the UN Peace Corps in... The Middle East. I think a lot of generals said that he had a promising career in the army if he continued. Yeah. But in order to run for the governor seat, he had to quit. Yeah. So, so that was. Now he's unemployed. <laughs> so technically, he's unemployed. It's he's true. unemployed. <laughs> um, he went to he went to Harvard Kennedy School of Government, mm-hmm. where he studied public policy, mm-hmm. and because he is young, it's often said that he picked his. Vice Governor candidate Sylvia Namurni, a woman who's a she's a career bureaucrat. Like, she's a career bureaucrat um, to become his vice governor candidate. Mm-hmm. She has over thirty years of experience in city government in Jakarta, so she's been through many cycles of governors. Yeah, and I think Sylvia's biggest position was she was the wali kota or mayor of Central Jakarta. So she has worked under Aho. Yes. Um, a little bit of controversy in Sylvia Murni is she was investigated for a corruption case in building a mosque, which has not been fully investigated, and for use of state funds for donation for Pramuka or Boy Scouts. Also misappropriating state funds. Well, city funds. Yeah. It's hard not to talk about... Agus's father in the context of why he's running for this. Yeah. There has been some talks about whether or not he's being pushed into retiring his from his army prematurely in order to fulfill his dad's post power syndrome. That's a lot of peas right there. That's a good illustration. Ah, you're welcome. <laughs> and moving on to candidate two. Candidate number two and also the incumbent ticket. Um Basuki Jaya Purnama, commonly known as Ahok and Jarot. Saiful Hidayat. So, like Silviana, Jarod has also been accused of unsavory or questionable actions regarding misappropriation of funds in the Sumberwaras hospital case. Mm-hmm. But there has not been any news or criminal allegations coming from that. So, that's also unresolved, right? Yeah. Okay. People see it more of like a government oversight rather than intentional misappropriation. Well, with Silviana, I think people think it's intentional, right? Yeah. Okay. And of course, Aha, we've covered. Many of it, yeah. And his ties to property developers. Listen to our third episode, Kali Jodo or Kali Ono, for yes. further details. <laughs> um, to be fair to Aho, none of this has been tied to him personally. Right? No one thinks Aho's actually corrupt for his own uses. People think that he just is playing a game of power to mm-hmm. get what he wants, I guess. And of course, the continuing blasphemy case over, uh, you know, is still happening. It's still ongoing. So, and essentially, I've talked to a few lawyers and legal experts, and they predict that this case will go on for between two to three years. Can he govern during that yes. time? Yes. So basically, he can govern 
Uh, as long as there's still a court case, he will not be in prison, which means that he will still be tarsanka or a suspect, which means he can still be a governor. That's Only if he's guilty and MA will he finally like be deposed. Wow. So that's Aho. He has a lot of baggage, clearly, yeah. as he's going about this campaign. Finally, Anis Baswedan and Sandiago Uno. Our third candidate. Anis Baswedan is the former Minister of Education and Culture. Mm-hmm. He is also a former rector uh-huh. at the University of Paramedina in Jakarta. I would say his background is in education. Mm-hmm. And is known for you know creating Indonesia Mengajar, which is Indonesia's equivalent for Teach for America. I think. Mm-hmm. And he was removed from his cabinet position uh, last year mm-hmm. by President Jokowi. For unknown reasons, but definitely seems it was in disgrace. Yes. And what's interesting about Anis is that out of all of the candidates... He's the latest one to kind of like join a pair with Sandiago Uno, his vice governor uh-huh. candidate, who's a businessman. A very successful businessman known for Saratoga Capital and a few other coal companies. Mm-hmm. And he's actually, he's personally funding this campaign. Yeah. The other two candidates have campaign money from, yeah. you know, fundraising, donors, yeah. whatever. This for Anis and Sandy. Yeah, and, it's, and Sandy, and Sandy is money. pretty young as well. Mm -hmm. Um, he's good looking he's well spoken he's articulate yeah I think he's well liked I think in one way almost he's more well liked than Anis at least for me I think it's because Sandy's kind of uncontroversial yeah for a businessman he seems very clean Mm -hmm. he's very modest and humble yeah he's just a bit he's you know he's made his career in business and now he's he's not like a take enemies sort of person he's Mm -hmm. very well mattered etc so yeah, that's just a bit of the three candidates we thought if you were not yet caught up on all the dramas that's going on, that that's a short summary. That Not you, so short. <laughs> the short, not so short summary of what you may have missed before the coming election. And right now, based on various polls, actually, a week before the election, nobody can really figure out who's nobody in the front. Nobody knows. <laughs> so basically, this is the latest polling um, published by the TikTok.com. They compiled a few polls. Charta Politica says that Ahok Jarod is leading at 37%. Anis Sandi is second at 27%. Agus Silvi is at 26%. So that's a tie between yeah, the second. Tight. And then 10% uh, didn't answer. Okay. That was in a period of the, between the 17th to the 24th of January with 767 respondents. Okay. Um, poll tracking Indonesia around the similar kind of like time period and size says at first place is Anisandi at 31.5%, Ahok Jarot in second place only 1% lower at 30.1%, okay. and Ago Silvian at 25%. All right. And then Lembaga Survey Politik Indonesia, LKPI, says Agus Silviana is at 27%, Anisandi is at 26%, and Ahok Jarot is at 26% as well. And 21% are undecided. Okay. Uh, what's, the, so, what's the time frame and sample size for that? 600 respondents, similar time frame. Okay. So essentially, like, it, it almost <laughs> is different. nobody knows what's going to happen, like, it's going to be tight. It's going to be tight. So many people like I've talked to in real life are undecided, you know? So it's really like we have no idea what's going on. If no one wins over 50%, there'll be a runoff election between two people. And I think that's what's going to happen. And that's happening in May, right? Yeah. Um, so more election. <laughs> In a city where the female population is more than 50%, it's important to consider the female vote. So what we do know is what these gubernatorial candidates are actually saying regarding women policies. And by we, I mean, we have to give credit to the amazing Kate Walton, who's one of the co-founders of Jakarta Feminist Discussion Group. And our good friend of the podcast who is writing this piece on different governorial positions on women, which will be up on pintarpolitik.com. Self-plug for my new hustle. <laughs> Thanks, Kate, for sharing with us your research and writing this piece. 
yeah, I mean, we couldn't have actually done this conversation without your research because there's, it's not, it's not out there. Like it's, it's hard to piece together. Sweden also pieced together this for another few good hours. Yeah. And even then it's also like a lot of digging, a lot of digging. All right. We've got one ticket that has a female candidate. So Sylvia Namorni, um, I just don't know a lot about her. And Mm -hmm. I'm just generally kind of hesitant when uh, women candidates talk about how, and I'm quoting Sylvie, who says that, um, then saya mewakili perempuan, saya tahu kebutuhan perempuan. What she's saying is that I am a woman, I know women's needs. Mm -hmm. And like, no, just because you're a woman doesn't mean you know the needs of all women Mm -hmm. among different classes and different, like, social needs right yeah because like there's a lot of unwoke women out there does Kelly and conway know what what women need clearly not like no. as a woman even you have to be educated to know about women's policies and i haven't seen based on their platform her knowledge of women issues and women's policy at all and what's funny really in a way is that Agus is almost like overly reliant on the fact that Silviana is a woman, woman to be like, oh, she'll handle the women's issues. Like yeah. I've already chose her. That's that's my part. Yeah, like I really applaud the fact, you know, that he chose a woman candidate that really mm-hmm. does show a kind of like commitment to the issue. And if anything, Agus seems to, you know, really respect women and a woman's role in not just the family, but workplace. Mm-hmm. He's very comfortable with, you know, wearing his daughter's Hello Kitty's backpack and all these different things. So he's definitely comfortable with his masculinity and comfortable with letting his wife do whatever. Mm-hmm. So I guess part of this is recognizing that, yes, it is a step forward to mm-hmm. propose a female candidate as part of a ticket. Yeah. But that's not... Just because that's a step yes. forward doesn't mean that's the only step Yeah, I forward. think part of it, the problem is that like there's an assumption that because he's good looking and young that he would get the woman's vote. But I think you have to earn a woman's vote because if you look at his actual policies, his policies on women are among the least developed. Yeah. What do you think is their most promising policy? Um, <laughs> none. <laughs> okay. Well, here's the thing, right? With with Agus and Sylvie, after much research, they haven't actually released a lot of detailed program plans Mm -hmm. for what they're proposing. Mm -hmm. They have this long, like, 40-chapter vision and mission statement in which they list down, like, you know, uh, what is a fair Jakarta like? What is a friendly Jakarta is like? And they list down what they want to do. But it's all bullet points. It's like prevent violence against women and children. That's one bullet point. I don't know what else they want to, you know. How are they going to do that? Right? Yeah. So that's what I found frustrating in terms of researching what their ticket stance is. <laughs> You're on just angry issues. you can't find it. <laughs> yeah. Also, they have the worst campaign website out of the three. And so I spent a lot of time on the website and I'm fairly frustrated <laughs> at how bad it is designed. Graphic designer Sweden is angry. Mm-hmm. But what's interesting, though, is that in terms of campaign rhetoric, I would say they're the ones who are actively speaking to women, uh, whether mothers yeah. or socialites or whatever, trying to get their vote. I think yeah. partially because... The messaging is Sophie. clear that they want women's vote, but I think it's just the particulars are not there. Mm-hmm. But they're definitely the ones as, you know, thinking about or having the good intention to have a woman-friendly policy or a government ahead in the time to come. Yeah. And maybe, you know, if they were elected... They would develop that policy. Uh, But certainly, as of this moment, if we're just looking at the evidence of what they're outlining, we we don't really see a lot of stuff, you know? Yeah. I mean, they've said really good things about wanting to empower women that women are the backbone of Jakarta society, but that's campaign speech, right? Like, that's all rhetoric. Mm -hmm. I would say that one of the things that Sylvie has pointed out that Mm -hmm. they want to do specifically is creating a crisis center for victims of domestic violence and sexual abuse and also establishing uh, rehab programs for victims as well as, I think, perpetrators Mm -hmm. via counseling. But as our wonderful friend Kate has pointed out, there's already a crisis center Um, in jakarta so this wouldn't be anything groundbreaking so that's unfortunately that's what agus and sylvia is all about i wish we can go into more detail about like if is there anything to dig through but that's pretty much it (laughs) okay so shall i move on to aho yeah so aho right aho and jarot they've had the advantage of two years of governance and a lot of their campaign promises are just like 
we've we'll done it. We'll continue it. <laughs> we'll increase this. Right. So some of the successful policies they've implemented yeah. is the Trans Jakarta buses, the female only Trans Jakarta buses, mm-hmm. um, in order to prevent sexual harassment in public transportation. Which we have some like mixed feelings about. I think it's a practical solution to have female only buses, but I I don't think it's the. It's not teaching men to like behave and actually yeah. be decent human beings. In fact, one of the additional policies is that they're gonna change the configuration of the seats. Yeah. So they're all facing forwards. So it's like, you can if anybody you know touches anybody, you yeah. can see them do it. Oh. And I'm like, why don't you change the seat and not the mindset? You know? Yeah. It's like, I'm just afraid that, you know, if someone, if it's full and then someone, a woman chooses not to use the female only carriage and then she uses the mixed sex carriage and then she gets harassed, people will blame her for like, why didn't she just use the female only carriage? Yeah. Mm, because I expected men to be decent human beings who respected my personal boundaries of like bodily autonomy. Turns out that's not part of the policy uh, solution. No. So it is definitely, it feels a little bit like a stopgap solution. Yeah. What I felt like with Ahuan Jarod is that, you know, they have the benefit of being the incumbent, right? So yeah. they can point to these things they've done and be like, look at our evidence. But mm-hmm. there are a lot of practical solutions. But I still feel like as somebody who cares about women's issues, mm-hmm. it's not necessarily getting to the core of They what... don't have a vision. They don't have like an overarching like revolution mental or mental revolution that they want to do in order to make women feel safer and better cared for in Indonesia. They don't want to change mindset. They just want to like, I feel like it's more like stopgap solutions. You like, just see a problem and they're like, yeah. oh, wait, let's yeah. find a solution is, for it. Which is not bad, but it's just like uninspiring. It's sort of like, oh, just throw more money at the problem, you know, instead of like changing men's attitudes or mindset towards mm-hmm sexual assault sexual abuse like i mean cool if they have this but they also need to be an active participant in campaigns against sexual assault and violence i think that would make these policies a lot more powerful Mm -hmm. like if they do this but also you know start a campaign against violence against women yeah Um, another i think one of the really cool thing is the uh, free cervical cancer vaccines that they've done to mm -hmm. seventy-five thousand school children so what this does is essentially preventing HPV from mutating to become cervical cancer. So actually what it does is like you can't get the cervical cancer unless you have HPV, human papilloma virus, which 60% of adults have it anyway. Actually, it's like the flu for people who have sex. And like most <laughs> it's of like the time... It's like the flu for people who have sex. Yeah, like it's most of the time people have it Mm -hmm. and but you can detect it in men so i think it's really cool that they've done that Mm -hmm. especially Um, since the vaccines are actually quite expensive i think one vaccine is like 750,000 rupiah which is about like 60 70 bucks and for you know low middle income families that's a lot of money yeah and in addition to these things that they've already provided as the incumbent yeah. administration, they're also proposing a couple of new ideas, including creating clinics mm-hmm. at the market. Mm-hmm. Because uh, Al himself has said that a lot of mothers, especially low-income mothers, they, spend time in pasar. Yeah, they spend a lot of time in the markets and they don't have time to go to Puskasmas clinics mm-hmm. or hospitals. Idea. That's a really good idea. I mm-hmm. like that a lot. So, Anya and Sandy, I think we found have... it very surprising in doing this research uh, how well developed their policies are, mm-hmm. especially for uh, towards women. They are the ones with pretty interesting economic solutions for women. So they have this credit usaha perempuan mandiri or independent women's business credit, where they want to give greater access and support for women entrepreneurs in order to, you know, provide for themselves and create businesses. Mm-hmm. And I think this is part of Okeoche, which is they love bandying this uh, idea okay, around. Okay. It's so catchy, right? It's not. No, it's not. <laughs> it stands for one kecamatan, one center for entrepreneurship. So they want to have in every sub-district a uh, center for entrepreneurship where our people can get mentorship and help in order to learn how to be entrepreneur. This mm-hmm. is where Sandy's entrepreneurial background kicks in and like showcases itself. And they actually explicitly said this is not going to come out of the Jakarta city budget. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a relationship between the Jakarta administration and banks, Mm -hmm. which I find very dubious because what kind of bank would agree to this without some sort of guaranteed, you know, upside? Unless you're not looking for profit, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's one kecamatan. Each kecamatan, there's an entrepreneurship center. Mm -hmm. 
there's a lot of kacamatan in the city. And did they talk about how much they want to put in? Like no, I think they just specified more like the facilities and resources. So as yeah. you say, mentorship, networking, yeah. co-working spaces. It's interesting that Anis and Sandy are really creating a platform that's dependent on entrepreneurship. Yeah. Which I think is very different from everybody else. Yeah. And I think what fits into that, and I think that makes it a good policy, is how they're also thinking about providing daycare for women in pasars or in markets and government offices. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, if you're supporting women to become entrepreneurs, you have to think about, you know, where they're going to have the daycare. So, Mm -hmm. you know, having this policy in place to me feels like they've actually thought about the whole process and the vision of having women entrepreneurship and making it work, which I think is very positive. And they are also the only one that has a uh, Patern- proposed paternity leave. leave. Which is super surprising and super impressive, I think. Yeah, for government workers, they are proposing a, a leave uh, for the expecting dads one week before birth and three weeks after birth. Yeah. And this can apply for the first three children. That's a pretty wide-ranging policy. And that doesn't exist yet. There's no paternity yeah. leave. So that's super cool. And in many ways, I think, uh, in these sectors, right, like mm-hmm. economy, mm-hmm. Anis and Sandy, I think, have more progressive policy ideas mm-hmm. than maybe Ao and Jarot. I think mm-hmm. Ao and Jarot are still yeah. framed around the idea of empowering mothers. Mm-hmm. Like, these are mothers that need to do side yeah. incomes or whatever. Well, Anis and Sandy it's are... Women as entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm, like, we'll provide the resources for yeah. them. Yeah. I applaud them for that. Don't know. Don't know where the money's going to come from. <laughs> or don't know if they're actually going to do that. But kudos for actually putting in the work for that. Mm-hmm. And they also have a pretty good policy against domestic violence. So they want to create 267 safe houses for women who are victims of domestic violence. Mm-hmm. They also want to introduce an application called Sister 123 to connect women to police offices in order to report domestic violence before uh, yeah i think part of the problem is that we know that a lot of police officers don't take uh reports reports of domestic violence seriously and like want this to be self you know so i really want a part of this is to be like training for police officers or or just generally law enforcement to become sensitive and become more aware that domestic violence is something a serious issue that should not be solved within the family but by law enforcement and none of the candidates are proposing any solution that's like that no Um, they just want to provide some sort of product right to treat the almost it feels like they're treating the after effect They don't want to nip the problem in the bud in terms of educating people that domestic violence is not a taboo topic. Yeah. Um, So essentially, there's just so much to work on and so much to be woke on. So it's actually really cool that Jakarta is thinking about these issues. I do think we have a history of strong, independent women and Mm -hmm. politicians, and that's respected in Indonesia. Um, Although it is a part of like this womanhood, motherhood, like vision, you know what I mean? It's like it's tied to this idea of the woman as a mother and the need to respect the woman as a mother instead of like a woman as a human being. Mm -hmm but I'll take what I can get. (laughs) I think there are some moments where we wear our idealist hats and some moments where we wear our pragmatist hats and be like, you know what? At least they think about some of their things and are willing to propose solutions that are going to benefit... Women in real life. Women, Yeah, women in real life. I hope that in discussing about these issues for our listeners who are Jakarta citizens and residents and uh, have the ability to vote, that you guys will have gained an insight into where each candidate stands on women's issues, and that will help inform you. February 15th, 2017. Vote.
Thank you so much for listening to us this week. Uh, we hope you kind of took away something from it. As always, um, music credits to Jazzart, Ryan Little, and Broke for Free. And if you haven't followed us on YouTube, um, our latest channel, uh, you should definitely follow us. Yeah. We're also still going to be on SoundCloud, but we want to uh, highlight YouTube a bit more. And also, it's a lot easier, I guess, to listen on YouTube than, yeah. say, like open up SoundCloud or you know, go into iTunes and download the podcast. So we're trying to make it easier for you guys to, to, uh, listen. to enjoy the episodes. Yeah. And once again, we always, always really want feedback. So email us at dialogicapodcast at gmail.com or send us a Facebook message or comment on YouTube. And as always, uh, we'll have resources and links at our website, theologica.id. And thanks so much.